Thanks. Um, this is actually perfect because I'm going to try to uh, engage some of the ideas in the, in the last uh, two presentations uh, explicitly in my presentation. Um, the title of my presentation is Formalization Policies in Formal Resource Sectors and the Re-Slash-D-Slash-Re-Centralization uh, of Power. Um, really, I I'm going to speak largely about two case studies, but I I'm hoping that this might have some broader resonance with other, other cases. What I really want to look at in this presentation is, in a sense, a historical understanding of formalization policy through decentralization phases of governance and then into a post-decentralization phase where central governments reassert their power over the formalization process and in a sense take over from uh, local governments. Now obviously the idea of local government means many things, uh, many different things in many different contexts. The, the cases I'm going to talk about are in Zimbabwe, uh, and uh, Witness already spoke a little bit about the role of rural district councils. I'm going to try to, to take that uh, further a little bit more. Um, and the other cases in Indonesia, where the idea of local government means something entirely different than, uh, than it means in, in Zimbabwe. Um, but, but both these cases are examples where in the 1990s and, and early 2000s, local governments had a role in managing um, artisanal uh, gold mining uh, or, or certain kinds of artisanal gold mining. Um, but what we've seen in actually the last five years in the 2006 to, to 12 period is that that power no longer exists, um, at, at least in the case studies I'm going to look at. So I, I want to look at really the framing of of what central government's roles are and what local government's roles are. And, and just to situate myself, I began working in 2005 with United Nations organizations on small-scale uh, mining issues. And what was actually remarkable, looking at the, the various years that I, I've worked with, interacted with UN agencies, is UN agencies always seem to focus on national-scale governance. That's the model of the UN. Um, and just to add to, to Louis' uh, list of formalization initiatives, uh, there's another one this year. Um, this year, uh, governments from more than 140 countries agreed to sign a mercury treaty, uh, which is a historic treaty uh, to deal with global mercury pollution. It, explicit in that treaty is that national governments must take new measures to formalize the small-scale gold mining sector in order to reduce mercury pollution. So, so are, Nash, are, are UN agencies missing the point, perhaps, when we focus so narrowly on the role of national governments? So I want to, in this presentation, look a little bit about the framing of formalization uh, policy uh, in relation to national interests. Uh, what, what are some of the interests that drive uh, national governments uh, in, in formalization thinking? Uh, secondly, I want to look at some of these case stud two case studies, uh, looking at the effects of re-centralizing power. And one of the questions I asked in field work in particular was, in this new phase of re-centralization, is becoming decriminalized a possibility for artisanal mining groups? Uh, and, um, and then I want to thirdly look at the extent to which these case studies might uh, contribute to a rethinking of our assumptions. So I'm interested in multiple bodies of literature here. Um, obviously, there's a lot of literature that questions the sort of technical framing that has become popular in some of the, the, uh, the scholarship. Uh, formalization is, is never a technical issue. It's always a political issue, uh, in my view. Um, to varying degrees, of course, um, and there's a, there's a whole literature uh, on institutions for managing resource sectors. Uh, Jesse Rebo is, a, is an interesting scholar who's actually published a paper called uh, Recentralizing While Decentralizing, and, and his paper uh, looks at, in a sense, how central governments subvert the decentralization process, even when decentralization is supposedly taking place. Um, then there's the political ecology literature, which really looks at the role of discourse, the, the, the idea of, of scale in, in how we conceptualize uh, resource struggles. Um, and, and a lot of the political ecologists uh, nowadays are arguing that, that we really need to, to look at subjective scaling uh, in, in, in our discourses. So in terms of methods, um, 
the, the case studies that I'm going to present draw on interviews uh, in Zimbabwe, which is my main area of, of focus, and, and also in central Kalimantan in Indonesia. I looked at uh, riverbed uh, gold panning uh, as well as land-based uh, gold mining. Um, and uh, looking at ongoing policy shifts. So, as I mentioned, uh, the, the 2000 Mercury Treaty is, is just one example of a long list of formalization initiatives that have bearing on informal mining activities, uh, and Ken provided uh, uh, quite, a, quite a number of other examples. Um, so this is, a, is a, a major sector of importance to national governments uh, and the, the global community for all kinds of reasons. Uh, estimates suggest 80 to 100 million people are dependent on artisanal uh, gold mining. Uh, and of course, the populations are diverse. You have women, men, uh, men children, all kinds of different organizations, uh, uh, structures of, of people uh, working in this sector. The question is, can national governments be responsive to this diversity? Can local governments be more responsive to this diversity in coming up with effective formalization plans? Uh, the scholarship is fragmented in this sector. I think we have to acknowledge that too. And uh, as mentioned in the previous uh, presentations, uh, how we frame formalization objectives, if it's in relation to a threat or an illicit problem or uh, a livelihood uh, promotion effort, uh, all these kinds of framings matter a great deal. And in, in the artisanal mining sector, I think it's fair to say that much of the discourse is focused on really negative framings of the problem uh, rather than an effort to try to build uh, livelihoods in, in mining communities. So we have seen also uh, some emergent discourse critiques um, that, that critique this whole language of, of illicitness and criminality. So in Zimbabwe and Indonesia, I think the, the discourses in, in, in the national newspapers, in policy documents, uh, they vary. Um, but I tried to just categorize some of the, the typologies of, of formalization narratives. And, and you have, uh, I mean, in Jakarta Post, you, you see articles decrying that small-scale mining is, is causing you know, acne on the landscape. Uh, sometimes these discourses are actually written by uh, consultants to large mining companies. Uh, so you have to look carefully who's producing the discourses about small-scale mining. But of course, small-scale mining is causing lots of environmental degradation in Indonesia, uh, as it is in Zimbabwe. Uh, you have narratives of threat management. So uh, scholars such as Vega who argue that, well, you know, providing uh, a legal status for miners is prerequisite is a precondition for development. It's necessary so that miners can access uh, technology services uh, and improve their, their productivity. Um, then you have uh, narratives that stress the, the subsistence nature. And, and rather than that saying that this is a necessarily a precondition, uh, they're, they're arguing that, well, we should recognize the legitimacy. So formalization is associated with a kind of uh, legitimization. Uh, um, and, and then you have, as Ken talked about, some of the conflict discourses. So here, here's just a, a photo to situate uh, an example of, uh, this is a World Bank field trip that I went on in 2009. Uh, and the World Bank supposedly was taking us to uh, an artisanal mining site. But as you can see, this doesn't very much look like an artisanal mining site. It's actually quite a, an established uh, company um, with a whole story to it, which I'm not going to get into. But the, the point is that in a lot of the discourse, actually, a lot of what donor agencies say is we need to scale up uh, to, you know, artisanal mining into responsible, business-like uh, mining. And what I actually noticed, which was interesting, is that in Zimbabwe, that kind of scale up uh, mentality is very much part of the government discourse to say that small-scale miners need to become responsible. Whereas Indonesia, actually, if you look at the laws, uh, they actually define community mining in a very limiting way, which is in some sense the opposite. Community mining is, is defined in, in Indonesian uh, laws in relation to uh, very limited uh, amounts of digging, uh, in relation to, uh, you know, it's actually talked about as a family kind of activity. So there's, there's different resonance with this model. I'm not going to get into all the different reasons for, uh, <laughs> for informalization, but we have to be aware of these. 
obviously, uh, as, as Ken mentioned, there's all kinds of lack of incentives for, for many miners. So the case study in Zimbabwe um, is, is, I think, interesting for lots of reasons. I mean, as, um, as Witness mentioned, uh, an economic crisis in Zimbabwe in the last uh, decade has, has made livelihoods very difficult. And uh, mining has become a huge source of subsistence uh, in rural areas. Um, some su estimates suggest that there's more than a million uh, small-scale miners uh, or people dependent on small-scale mining in Zimbabwe. Uh, the numbers are very difficult to, 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 uh, to, to know. But what I wanted to start off with in, in this case study was looking at uh, Insiza district, which is located right near uh, Bulawayo. And Insiza district is an example of, 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 of a context where in the 1990s a lot of innovative programs were attempted uh, with donor support. Uh, from Swedes, uh, German donors, uh, Canadian donors even. Uh, and the, the, the local uh, rural district council in, in CISA district was actually empowered uh, by the central government to issue uh, permits to riverbed gold panners. And some of the studies that have been done, uh, and you see some of them uh, cited here, indicate that this was a very important and very innovative model. Uh, it was a, a really a, a model that uh, scholars argue in other districts in Zimbabwe and other countries in Africa should emulate. Uh, not just focusing on central governments, but actually saying that, that rural district councils, which are close to the ground, supposedly, um, could, could offer permits. Uh, so, there are lots of problems with this model, uh, and I'm not going to go into all the problems and, and the lessons learned. Uh, there wasn't enough training for rural district council officers, is, is, was one of the issues that came out, out of interviews. Um, but a positive side, uh, local artisanal miners associations were formed, uh, and were managing to, to varying, various degrees, were actually managing some of the risks in, in terms of riverbed panning. <laughs> That changed in 2006. Uh, so in 2006, what I'm arguing is, is we can understand this operation, uh, no illegal mining, um, to be a kind of recentralization of power. Uh, the central government in, in June of 2006 removed the power of rural district councils to issue permits. Then. Later that year, and actually I, I was even doing some field work at the time, and, uh, and then shortly after that, I, I asked the rural district councils what their perspective was on this, and they didn't even know about this policy shift at the time. Uh, they hadn't been consulted. But later that year, in 2006, the, uh, the central government launched uh, a, a massive police crackdown. Uh, more than, uh, between 2006, 7, uh, 8, and 9, more than 40,000 miners were arrested, according to the government, for illegal mining uh, and smuggling related offenses. Uh, in fact, I was back in Zimbabwe earlier this year and, and uh, got the actual numbers of people still in prison from this phase. And more than 9,000 miners are actually, uh, people are still in prison for mining uh, or smuggling related offenses. Um, and a number of different central government institutions became involved. It's not just one uh, central government entity. We're talking about police squads, military squads, uh, central intelligence organization. So this is an elaborate recentralization kind of campaign in some sense. Uh, and new environmental impact assessment requirements were imposed uh, and, and stricter penalties were enforced. So I, I've been trying to study the, the role of the miners' associations uh, through this period. Um, and obviously, miners' associations find it very difficult to advocate for the rights of unlicensed, you know, e allegedly illegal miners. Um, initially, the United Nations project that I was working uh, on in, uh, up to 2007 was trying to use the environmental threat uh, issue as a rationale for, for legalizing rather than punishing minors. But it became a kind of um, uh, problematic just to even talk about mercury pollution because that discourse was being used as the very rationale for, for policing. So again, I mean, it, the, the, the role uh, supposedly of, of formalization is to look at multiple different scales 
of responsibility. But as I mentioned at the start, United Nations programs and, and, and a lot of development discourses focus really narrowly on the national scale, and this is extremely problematic in Zimbabwe, uh, where, where decisions are being made uh, in Harare, far away from the mining areas. So one of the issues that became particularly compelling is this issue of the environmental impact assessment. Uh, and in a sense, this is an example of uh, a formalization requirement that is far uh, beyond the, the means of miners. Uh, miners stress that you know, they want to manage the environment uh, more soundly, but they need a, a program of regulation that's simple, easy to understand, uh, not too bureaucratic, and appropriate. And this is a cartoon in the, uh, in the Herald, which is actually a state, uh, a state newspaper, just showing the magnitude of the challenges. This was just showing that uh, this is a, a million Zimbabwe dollars at the time, uh, but it's showing that, that miners can't afford the EIAs. This I'm not going to describe at all, because uh, it's rather too complicated, but just to show that there are so many factors that have contributed to central government interest uh, cracking down on miners. It's, it's a very complex political story. So how do central government uh, structures interact with local government structures? Well, the reality is that there has been very minimal uh, sort of engagement when it comes to making decisions over licenses. There's all kinds of reasons why uh, rural district councils are arguing, actually, that they should be more empowered. And the, the, the big one is the issue that they, they, they're so uh, poorly empowered right now with respect to revenues. Uh, and, and this is actually a really important comparison with Indonesia. In Indonesia, uh, local governments receive more than 30% of mining revenues from large-scale mining. Uh, in, in, in Zimbabwe, the rural district councils are receiving less than 0.0 I think it's actually less than 0.001%. So, I mean, the meaning of, of, of local government is completely different in these two countries. So I'll just say some brief things before I conclude uh, about the Indonesia case. Um, as in Zimbabwe, uh, gold miners in Indonesia are blamed for lots of environmental problems, for sure. And there's an advocacy also to to, to turn the sector into a more responsible sector. Um, as I mentioned, the idea of, of local government means something different. There's also a, an interesting trend in the scholarship right now in Indonesia, and here I reference um, Obedzinski, uh, that he's cautioning that the discourse in 2004 was already pronouncing local governments as failures, but he's actually, in a sense, questioning this. He's saying decentralization in the forestry sector is being presented as a failure. Um, but he's talking about the, the role of, of local governments, and, and he's saying that they're, they're in a sense being blamed. And, and so what we've seen in the post-2009 period is central government uh, in Indonesia imposing moratoriums. And, and this is the case uh, in central Kalimantan, where um, both mining and, and logging permits have been held up in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a national reevaluation process. Um, and this is just to situate a, a, a copy of a, a license in the area of cent central Kalimantan where I visited, where uh, the, the, the person who put together this application is, it had to send this to Jakarta and is still waiting for an outcome, or, or was at least uh, at the time. So he was waiting, and, and it wasn't very po uh, positive actually about his ability to, to get a license. Um, so arguably, a lot of the discussion in, in Katingan district in central Kalimantan uh, about these issues is now being influenced by a national environmental process. You could argue, I'm, I'm getting to the, near the end, I will, I will conclude very rapidly, but I, I think this is a really interesting case where rather in Indonesia right now, in, in central Kalimantan in specifically, there is a discourse, especially with issues, uh, concerns about RED and, and other uh, environmental planning movements, to, to look at seriously uh, land use. But the question is, to what degree do areas like this, as you see on the left, this is a, a mined area, this is a moonscape of um, a very degraded area, uh, where if this is uh, being mined, is this causing new environmental degradation? Or conversely, uh, if, if this is uh, to be uh, a, a no-go area, 
is, this, is banning mining here going to cause more environmental degradation elsewhere? And so that was one of the questions I looked at, and this is the last slide I'll show, where actually in, in 2011, uh, what I found in field work was that there had been an escalation of policing, very different from the policing in Zimbabwe, uh, but policing uh, and arrests have contributed to livelihood insecurity. Um, there, is less, there was be less gold being produced, um, and some people had actually stopped mining uh, in, in these policed areas and gone into more uh, environmentally unsound uh, river mining practices. So that, that's been a concern. So just to conclude my point in this presentation, that the recentralization of power uh, over formalization processes can create uh, new uh, problems of, of marginalization. Uh, central governments impact m uh, mining communities in different ways. Uh, new environmental problems can, can arise. There's obviously a need, as, as Ken mentioned as well, for streamlining uh, uh, formalization requirements. And that's a, that's a key point. Um, but uh, the final point I wanted to make was that, that governments might also be, be well advised to look at policies for supporting people who might not be formalized. There's so much fixation on formalizing sectors when the reality is that not everybody's going to become formalized. So what services are available for people who operate in that, that sort of gray territory of, of informality? Thanks.